Well, yes, indeed, my friends. As, as the people on the booth uh, at the desk told you, we are going to be here for a while. Strap yourselves in. Get comfortable. You're in the, you're in the booth with me, Riley Knight, him, Paul Cheon, and Paul. We've got some big names lined up in the feature match here. They're ready to get underway, so let's not waste any more time. It's time for round number 13 of Pro Tour Guilds of oh, Ravnica. Welcome to the feature match area here at Pro Tour Guilds of Ravnica. My name's Ronnie Knight, joined by Paul Chan from Wizards R&D. Good afternoon, Paul. Great to have you along. Good to be here. I, I will say this. That was the fastest I've ever seen Rich Hagan run, and it was to see the control mirror between Guillaume Wafatap and Shota yesterday. Yeah, we, I tell you what, we're going to have plenty of time to get to that one. We, we are not in a rush to get to uh, to the Grixis versus Jeskai control <laughs> matchup between Wafatap and Yasuoka, but we are going to kick things off as a result between uh, with a game between Makihiro Mihara, Makihito Mihara, excuse me, Japanese old school superstar from the Last Samurai team. You see him on your screen there. He's playing Golgari mid range, and his opponent. Well, you may have heard of this guy, John Finkel, John, one of the greatest, John if not John the who? greatest player of all time. May have fallen across your desk once or twice here, yeah. Paul. And he's on. Is it Drake's? In my mind, this is very much the matchup that defines modern standard. Right. This is it, Drake Thack, I think, really rose in popularity because of the existence of the Black Green Mid Range deck. The mm -hmm. Black Green Mid Range deck grinds you out, plays a bunch of removal spells, and then just has a kind of that late game inevitability. But you know what's really good against a bunch of spot removal spells? Arclight Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can't just use a single removal spell to get that off the board. So this is a Drake's deck was kind of built to feast on the kind of dominance of this black green deck. So going in, I would say that the is it Drake's deck is favored, but Makito Mihara also has to know that is it Drake's was one of the likely decks because it was kind of one of the breakout decks over the last few weeks. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he had a couple of options. One really important card that he could be looking to play is a card like Vraska's Contempt, mm -hmm. which permanently exiles the Arclight Phoenixes that John Finkel can play. Yeah, he'll be looking to lean on those cards pretty heavily. And with two copies here, Mihara, well set up to go against the 3 2 Hasters. I want to draw your attention to the legacy of these two players. Paul, I'm sure that this weekend we've got a lot of new Magic players joining us. Maybe you've picked up Arena, maybe jammed a couple of games as standard. Welcome. It is great to have you. It is so exciting to have uh, an influx of new players to Magic, especially at a time where standard is well and truly at the top of its game, right? We've had we've had a bit of touch and go with some with with the with the health and diversity of standard in 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 throughout you know this year, but we are right back on track. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, when when people talk about how uh, you know kind of the uh, standard formats that are a bit more defined, you know, mm -hmm. I will have my friends come up to me and go like, dude, what, what, what's, what are you the, doing? what's the deal? You know, come on, what are you going to do to fix standard? Exactly. Uh, so you know, often you know, I will get the complaints, but on the other side. You know, when they do feel like standard is fun and they enjoy it, they let me know as well. Oh, so I have I have received those positive feedbacks as well, <laughs> especially with regards to this set, because the thing is, every guild is playable in yep. standard. And we've seen that over the course of this tournament. We have indeed, and Golgari and Izzet are certainly amongst the top of the pile here. Mihara on Golgari with a great value creature here with Jade Light Ranger. You see that played on turn three here after the death of his... Uh, his Druid of the Cow there. Um, but as I say, Paul, I want to talk about the legacy of these players because John Finkel, if you're not aware of John Finkel, it, the, let's let's talk... Who, who, he's, he's the Michael Jordan. Yeah, right? John Finkel is the greatest Magic player of all time. Yes. He's the most accomplished. He's got a Hall of Fame career, uh, career that if you splice it in half... Mm. That's just two Hall of Fame careers. Yes, yeah. He, you might even be able to splice it into three. To three questionable yeah. inclusions for sure. But right. yes, Finkel is, again, we're, we're talking like Wayne Gretzky right. of, of Magic the Gathering. Makihiro Mihara, Makihiro Mihara for, play, for players who are not even new to Magic, but even have joined within the last decade or so, they may not be aware of, of the legacy of this player. A, a player of the world champion in 2006 and a well-known for his Dragonstorm deck. Yeah, definitely. One of those players, he's kind of part of that old guard. You know, he's part of Team Final Last Samurai. Riot, which is a, 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 a collection of you know man, many uh, Japanese pros that maybe don't play full time necessarily anymore, but several Hall of Famers on that squad. And Mihara, yes, winning the World Championships mm. with Dragonstorm, and uh, it was really fun to watch him do that. And you know, he, he kind of played when when I kind of also played competitively, and he was definitely considered one of the top tier players at the time. I was in year eleven 
when he was I was I was a, I was a junior in high school when he won oh, his, uh, oh. his world championships. So just that's a, a whippersnapper. Just a you're just a, a young ankle biter I was. Yeah. As we see, shock now remove Jade Light Ranger. The pace of this game a little slower than what we uh, we have come to anticipate. But Finkel doing a good job of leveraging his removal to keep the board clear. We don't often see the Drake's deck adopting such a controlling posture. But now Arclight Phoenix is getting busy as well, yeah. so Finkel has really threaded the needle here. Yeah, Finkel using maximized velocity and targeting targeting uh, Makahito Mihara's own creature to get that third spell onto the battlefield to get that to deal with that Arclight Phoenix. But one of the best cards against the Is It Drake's deck, Vivian yeah. Reed, yeah. as the minus three ability allows you to destroy an artifact, enchantment, or a flyer. Yeah, creature with flying, and we don't often see green able to uh, directly destroy creatures, but this is a, a, a little twist of the tail here for Reed. And uh, unfortunately for uh, Mihari, oh, sorry, I guess not unfortunately. I mean, he had the decision. I was going right. to say, he could have taken <laughs> down the Phoenix if he wanted if he wanted to, but he's going to go upstairs, gains, uh, picks himself up a land here, yeah, and so that means that the 3-2 is, uh, is still ready to rumble. Yeah, so it looks like he's choosing to get that additional card because if he uses the minus ability on the Arclight Phoenix, Vivian Reed would go down to two, mm -hmm. and it's just super likely that John Finkel would be able to get those three spells again mm -hmm. to you know, kind of get that Arclight Phoenix back onto the battlefield to get the Vivian Reed. So instead, Makahito Mihara looking to get a card instead. But Crackling Drake, maximized velocity yeah. in the graveyard and so he can give this haste to get that Vivian off the battlefield. This is bananas. We've seen this in standard in, in previous GPs. We've seen this deck in the hands of Eduardo Sajgalek in Arna Hush and Beth's hands as well, a top eight to cr on both sides of the Atlantic, Paul. And the explosive power of maximized velocity. Uh, I talked to Eduardo about the card and he said he just want, he always wanted to draw it. He just always wanted to draw it. If you slam it onto your, your Drake that's been freshly cast, that un that you can unload a redonkulous amount of damage at a moment. Yeah, notice. It, it has the ability to kind of basically win games out of nowhere, mm. especially in matchups like this where the games are a bit grindy, right? So you guys are just kind of going over each other's threats and at any point in the game, you know, if, if this game goes on for a few more turns, John Finkel could easily get something like 10 to 12 spells in his graveyard. Mm. Then he draws an Enigma Drake or a Crackling Drake, uses maximized velocity, slam in there. and can Just kill. Makahito is at 12. Yeah, yeah. And it, it can end the, end the game in short order. And as you were saying, in grindy decks, often, you know, you get that one turn breathing room. They deploy a massive threat. You've got to turn to draw a card, untap your mana, maybe find an answer. But maximized velocity changes that. And we're seeing Finkel here pull, pull himself ahead. Uh, you know, in, in getting that Vivian Reed off the board. Although, Ravenous Chupacabra, a great answer here from Mihara. Right, right. So, we, we talk about how, you know, the Black Green deck has access to a lot of removal. It's still very, very effective at dealing with the Drakes. Maximized Velocity, of course, a good way to answer, you know, Chupacabras as Chupacabra kills things at sorcery speed. So, John Finkel does need to find another threat because Makahito Mihara might be able to muster... Uh, Maki, uh, sorry, John Finkel quickly, you know, putting Makahito Mihara on a four-turn clock here with the Phoenix. But he needs to find another big threat because Mihara now is going to have a big board. He has multiple cards in his hand. And if he drops something like a Carnage Timer, he can't swing the race back in his favor. So when Radical Idea was first revealed to the world, I looked at it, I'm like, here we go. Oh, wait. Oh, no. Okay. Card stinks. This is terrible. It's no thing twice. I was... Re I was... I was... I was dialing your numbers into my phone about to give you a piece of my mind but then i realized with goblin electromancer in, in the business as well we have really got a stew going here and john finkel is showing us exactly what this tasty brew looks like drawing two cards for two mana discarding an excess land that you didn't need and this is the power of the electromancer in multiples it's not doing a huge amount in this list but halving the cost of two drops is huge. Right. I think Radical Ideal is, is extremely important in this type of deck. And I've seen a lot of players actually just go for the four, full four copies of Radical Idea over, you know, some of the one-minute cantrips and mm -hmm. even Tormenting Voice as a way to just kind of prevent yourself from getting flooded. It just does everything the deck wants wants to do. It can it can uh, be cast at instant speed, which is a nice bit of gravy. But the real thing is discarding cards, discarding Arclight Phoenixes, that's what you want to do, or excess lands, as you said, a bit of flood insurance, you know but being able to string together cheap spells because both halves of the jumpstart, they count as individual spells for Arclight Phoenix. This card is, is almost purpose-built to go hand-in-hand hand or, or hand-in-wing with Arclight Phoenix. Yeah, and now given that John Fickle is down to just one card in hand, I think he it is possible that Mihara looks to go for the minus effect. Nope, it looks nope. like he still wants to go go with the plus one here because it is less likely now that John Finkel can put together three spells mm. to be able to return that Arclight Phoenix. And given that he's at nine, um, 
I would have thought that he would go for the minus, but it looks like he just wants to continue getting ahead on cards here. And he's going to try to weather the storm for just a little longer here. And, and Paul, this is a, a classic move from the Golgari mid-range list, a deck that is described as being value-oriented. Value is, is a kind of nebulous, vague concept when it comes to games of Magic, but, but maybe you can talk to some of the newer players that have joined us today uh, about what a value deck is trying to do. So what a value deck is trying to do is basically play a bunch of cards um, that do something when it enters a battlefield or get you ahead on cards. Mm -hmm. Cards like Ravenous Chupacabra is a 2-2 body, which is a card, and when it enters a battlefield, it removes a creature. So even when, you, when your opponent uses a spell to deal with the threat that you've played, you're still up a card ultimately. And when you fill up your deck with cards like that, eventually you're just going to two-for-one your opponent out. And, a bit, you know, and there are some cards that say, don't get you the straight... I mean, Ravenous Chupacabra, best case scenario, gets, a, gets you a two-for-one, but if you play it as a two-two, kill an opposing creature, and then use it to chump block and, and save, like, four or five life, that's right. not, not a two-for-one, but that's a whatever, one what, point five for one, whatever. Right. But that incremental slow, incremental advantage will grind an opponent out, and that is what we call getting value. Right. Got to get value. Got to get value. You got to get that always, value. always. And that's why we see Mihara with a, a list full of explore creatures. Another classic example of, of a value card. Planeswalkers, ongoing incremental advantage. That's what these this, uh, value engines are all about. Finkel, there are some value engines in this list, but he's looking to play a much more explosive game. Right. And now Mihara is kind of in a difficult position. If he knew John Finkel's hand, which is just all lands, he would kind of be looking to dis deploy his aggressive threats. Uh, quickly, but he still just needs to be really careful. He's currently sitting at nine life, and mm -hmm. as we've seen in the past, the Is a Drake stack can have some pretty explosive starts. Merfolk Branchwalker trades off with the Goblin Electromancer here, so Finkel on the defensive just a little bit, but it looks like the old Ravi Chup's going to get across and get some dinner here. And Finkel down to 18. Let's see what Mahara's next move is. As you can see, he's got plenty of business in hand, including the mighty Carnage Tyrant. I was expecting to see a lot more of the dinosaur this weekend. Been a little subdued so far. Uh, well, the thing with Carnage Tyrant is it really shines in the mirror and mm. also against control decks, but it is pretty weak against other aggressive strategies. And I think going into the tournament, a lot of people expected uh, white Weenie and Mono Red in Force. And when you do expect something like that, Carnage Tyrant might be a b card that's better suited in the sideboard. Well, Mihara has a copy in hand ready to go with it by the look of things. Yeah, and Mihara now has the, an interesting decision here. He has to figure out, um, does he want to just play Ravenous Trooper, Cobra, and Jaylight Ranger here to put multiple threats on the battlefield, or does he just want to slam that Carnage Tyrant and just try to race John Finkel? Let's see what he's done here. Has, oh, he, he played has the gone tyrant. with the 7-6 okay. here, so putting a lot of pressure on the American superstar, as we see now. Arclight Phoenix getting busy once again, going to knock Mihara down to 6, but... I think, he's, I think he's feeling pretty confident. Finkel is just out of gas here. Yeah, at this point, Mihara has just continued to fall, uh, pull further ahead on cards here, and John Finkel just not finding you know, the radical ideas and the cantrip spells that he needs to find an additional win condition here. One of the things that you need to keep in mind whenever you're playing against a red spell-based deck is, is their, what we call their reach potential, right? Reach is a concept in Magic that involves... Uh, having burn spells point at your head. If you're on six and a deck can cast two lightning strikes, do six damage straight to your dome, that's called reach. Yeah. The Drake's deck doesn't have a lot of reach. It doesn't play lightning strike typically. It doesn't play other cards that go to the face. And this means that it's easy to stabilize Paul at a lower life total. Yeah, yeah. The only thing he, Mihara needs to be concerned about are shocks mm. and additional copies of Arc Life Phoenix. Those are the cards that he needs to be concerned about. So right now, he just wants to end the game this. as quickly as possible, this. and he's yep. in a really good spot. He might want to just use the minus ability on Dark Life Phoenix, yep. and that's what he does. Just to wrap things up well and truly, a Jade Light Ranger as well reveals Khan on the top. <laughs> oh, Mihara, not interested in Khan. He's going to pick up a Woodland Cemetery from the second Explore here and plays it immediately. This one is a very, very tangled web here for Finkel to get himself out of. He finds Discovery there, Dispersal. There is, a, there is a way. He needs to go Dispersal, Put another Arclight Phoenix into his graveyard, find another cantrip spell, and then another cantrip spell right. after that. Here's, here's one. Oh, oh my, my goodness. goodness! He's done it! He can do he's it! Done it. He needs one he more, more spell. sorcery, and he is going to slam across for six out of nowhere. John Finkel, the man, the myth, the legend. He needs one a spell. One of the top two cards has to be an instant or It's sorcery. on the bottom. A big whiffski for he number one. He needs a spell. Off the top. It's, it's a lava coil. coil. <laughs> it's oh a lava my coil. goodness. He can burn one of the this opponent's is insane. creatures. The third spell for the turn. No flying blockers for Mihara. Two triggers of the Arclight Phoenix as he dumps him into play. And we're going to game two with an astonishing victory oh from Johnny God. Magic. 
oh my goodness the, me. The number of things that needed to go right for John there to win was just incredible. He needed to find a card that not only put Arclight Phoenix into his the graveyard, but he also needed to find, he needed to chain more uh, uh, cantrip effects to be able to pull that off. What that an incredible ridiculous. performance. You, you can tell, look at this, just another, just another day in the office for Johnny Magic. What a master he is. Oh my goodness me. I love the way that he gave himself every single chance to win. Ooh. The other thing I want to point out here, from Maki, Makihiro Mihara's turn, or for perspective, you just got to take the lumps. Right. Like, he played fantastically. I love the way he, he postured himself to win the game as early as possible, but John Finkel just running rings around him. Yeah, he, he did everything that he could there. I think the, the only thing that maybe Mihara could be thinking about is uh, m maybe potentially using a Vivian at one point mm. to shoot down the Arclight Phoenix to force John to string together spells because he did take three additional points of damage mm. at an earlier point in the game. Oh boy. Well, I tell you what, we're going to cool off a little bit here. We're going to have a get of a break, my friends, and we'll be back with more action from, uh, from Pro 2 at Gilza Ravnica. You're not not going to want to miss a minute, my friends. We'll be back on the other side of this. Looking for a place to hang out and play Magic? Head to your local game store this and every Friday to play Friday Night Magic events. Get more info at magic.wizards.com slash FNM. Welcome back to the Feature Match area here at Pro Tour Guilds of Ravnica, coming to you live from Atlanta, Georgia, USA. My name's Riley Knight, and it's my great pleasure to, to welcome back Paul Cheon uh, into the booth here. Paul, we just saw John Finkel, wow, tear Makihita Mihara to shreds out of nowhere and uh, showcase the explosive potential of this Is It's Drake list. We're, uh, we're seeing the players uh, go through the process of sideboarding right now, but I want to talk about Arclight Phoenix. People kind of... We're a little slow to wake up to this card, the power of this card, but right now it is running the tables, uh, not just in standard, but in modern as well. Yeah, th the thing with that card is when you first look at it, you're like, okay, well, how realistic it is, is it for me in a normal deck to be able to play three spells to get this back? Is it really worth it to build my deck around it? Yep. Well, we're in a pretty unique standard environment where we do have lots of access to cheap cantrips mm. and lots of deck manipulation spells to actually enable this deck. And, you know, players have discovered a way to kind of fully harness the power of Arclight Phoenix to go with, you know, the other drakes that you have access to. And of course, in Modern, anytime you can put a creature into play for free, yeah. somebody in Modern is going to figure out a way to Eventually. put it into play. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it took a while for Hollow One to finally break through, but we saw it and, uh, and you know, I think we're going to see a similar thing take place in, uh, in Modern with uh, Arclight Phoenix. But right now, all that we got on the agenda is standard, my friends. We're very happy to bring you coverage of this wonderful format. It really has been totally crushing it at the moment as we see a pretty aggressive ramp strategy from Mihara with a Druid of the Cow following up a Llanowar Elves. I really like the way Druid of the Cow is positioned again right now against the format at large. Obviously, you know, a 1-3, 2-drop 
Mana Dork is not the best card at, in that position, but just a, a two, as a two mana one three against cards like Vishina Pyromancer. Whew, no, I think I think it's out. uniquely positioned very well right now. Mm -hmm. Not only does it synergize well with Fine Finality and that you can ramp and play Finality on Druid of the Cal and have it live and wipe the board, but on top of that, White Weenie is very popular, which has a ton of one mana two one creatures in its deck that it can block. It doesn't get shocked, mm. and you can also just use it to block a lot of the red creatures, like you said. So it kind of just has the the meta game is just in a perfect spot right now, where even a card like Druid of the Cal, which you normally wouldn't expect to be a standard powerhouse is being played right now. And we see it respect the uh, command the respect of John Finkel dying to that uh, Lava Coil, or even being exiled, rather, to that Lava Coil. And a Wild Growth Walker. During the break, Paul, you and I had a chat about this card. It's in the sideboard of Makahita Mahara, and he's brought it in against Is It Drakes. That is a little puzzling to me, but, I mean, this guy, he's on a whole, no whole other level. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, the, th the thought process behind that is the fact that he just wants to have uh, access to more life gain because this... This uh, is a Drake's deck kind of ha kind of has the ability to deal a bunch of damage out of nowhere. So if you can get that Wild Growth Walker onto the battlefield and use that package in conjunction with cards like Jaylight Ranger and Merfolk Branch Walker, all of a sudden you can't just lose to John Finkel stringing together mm. three perfect cards and kill you with two Arc Light Phoenixes out of nowhere. That's the other thing that I was doing during the break as well. well look at this start. It. A nice steaming bowl of my own words there because I was talking about the lack of reach for the Is It, is it deck, but uh, Finkel, well and truly made me look like a silly sausage. But right now, he's the one that's looking a bit of a silly sausage here as Makahita Mihara goes from strength to strength in uh, in, in, a, in attack here with a Wild Growth Walker being followed up by not only a Merfolk Branch Walker, but a Ravenous Chupacabra to clear the way. And Finkel is under an enormous amount of pressure. Yeah, I mean, this is the pure power of a card like Lanowar Elf. With Lanowar Elf on the play allows you to just put so much more pressure on your opponent. And when you're playing a, a, a slower deck, you know, it's it's really hard to come come from behind when, when your opponent goes Elf into Druid of the Cal into two more spells. And John Finkel is playing the version with Electromancer, mm. meaning that it's extremely unlikely that he has Fiery Cannonade in his in his sideboard. He's probably going with the Entrancing Melody plan instead. And as a result, he couldn't he can't use that to, you know, maybe deal with both the Chupacabra and Lanowar off on yeah, the battlefield. It's gonna be much more difficult for him to take out the trash here. And that means that Mihara is sitting pretty behind the army that he's assembled. None of these creatures sort of massive world-beating standouts in and, in and of themselves, but I tell you what, they're really being put to work here. And Finkel's been given pause. Let's have a look at what's going on in his hand and, and see what he's got to... Uh to do here. Maybe a Crackling Drake is the play for him. Yeah, he, he's running out the Crackling Drake, and it, this is the... Oh, no, no. Nope. He's going with the Melody. Okay, Wild Growth Walker switches sides here. Bit of a change of allegiance. Pops on the Guernsey from the other side of the battlefield now. Now, Finkel isn't going to be able to do much with the Explore ability of Wild Growth Walker, but having a 2-4 blocker and also preventing Mihara from growing the Walker even further and gaining more life, I guess that's pretty important. Yeah, Mihara just... He really just wants to put a giant creature on the battlefield here if he can. Gets in for six. This is going to put John Finkel down to four. So let's see if he has a decent follow-up here. So Finkel. He's under a lot of Whoa, pressure. But look, at this. Oh, look at this. Crackling Once Drake's again, not going to get it done. The Ravenous Chupa Looper. The Ravenous Chimmy Changa once again getting the job done for Mihara, keeping the board nice and clear. And look at this anemic beatdown plan for the Japanese superstar. He's getting it done with some very tiny creatures. But I think they're going to go the distance. There's not much that Finkel can do. Yeah, I mean, unless he does, he did bring in a Fiery Cannonade out of his sideboard. Um, that would be the only thing that would get him out of this because that would be huge because <laughs> basically, frankly, it would just destroy Mihara's entire board. Ops. So does he have a fiery cannonade? Downstairs goes the charter course off the top. He needs something very special. It's another opt. Running out of breathing room here is the Hall of Famer on the right of your screen. For two mana now, it might be another charter course, but I mean, on four life, he's facing down. I mean, not, not particularly potent attackers, Paul, but they're going to yeah. get the job done, this great yeah, team. I, I, this is going to be really, really difficult. He's going to need to find multiple arc, bound, arc light phoenixes, but I, even Ooh. then, I don't think that's enough. Double shock off the top. Double Shock does keep him alive if he has a mountain. No, but no, he doesn't. doesn't have anything else. So we are going to go to game number three after Mihara, with a bunch of misfits and freaks, gets the job done and gets himself across the line, revenging himself upon the greatest of all time for that game one victory. These guys are going to hit the sideboards once again. And uh, in the meantime, we're going to get the chance to jump over to one of our other tables. We can see what's going on in... The much uh, flaunted, much taunted <laughs> uh, control mirror here. Shota Yasuoka, Guillaume Wafatapa. Oh, ho, ho, ho. shock horror, Paul Chion. This is game number two already.
Wow. A blistering pace of play from these two players means that the control decks are uh, already well and truly into the second game here. And looks like Wafo Tapper is well set up with a Legion War Boss in addition to uh, Niv Mizzet and Teferi taking a part show to Yasuoka. Uh, Nickel Bolas not having his time to shine. Looks like uh, the Frenchman's put himself in a great spot. Yeah, he's he's uh, he has that creature plan. He pl he plays. You know, you've seen creature decks in the past play cards like History of Banalia because a lot of decks will board out removal against control decks. Mm -hmm. And in order to keep them honest, Guillaume Afatapa opting to go with uh, Legion War Boss out of the sideboard for this specific matchup. On top of that, he's got Niv Mizzet in his deck, which is extremely difficult to deal with out of the deck because it cannot be countered. And a lot of the, uh, and you know, and even if they've got that removal sp spell ready and waiting, you're still going to get your value off of your uh, off of your big dragony boy there. So uh, Wafo Tapper, it looks like, has uh, well and truly bamboozled his opponent here with uh, Legion War Boss really turning up the heat, yeah. getting across for a, a big stack of damage, five damage coming across here. And I think I see another Niv Mizzet in his hand. Oh, so look at this. that's going to be, <laughs> and look, at, he has a handful of cards as well. I mean, I don't even know the collection of cards that Shota could have here to be able to come back from this. Let's have a look and see what uh, what Yasuoka can stitch together here. It looks like we've got a, a Ral, is it Viceroy here? But that even that is just not doing much in the face of the Onslaught from Waffle Topper here. Yeah. And a Sinister Sabotage yep. is enough to wrap things up. <laughs> Unbelievably, ladies and gentlemen, this round, this round brought to you by M. Night Shyamalan because we have a twist in the tail. The Control Mirror has finished before the mid range, uh, the mid range slugfest on our front table, but Guillaume Wafo Tapper with Jeskai Control, he is representing hard. I thought we were still going to be on game one, to I, be honest. I, yep. Because because oftentimes what happens in the control matchups is you kind of run each other out of your threats because your decks is, are just both full of so much removal. Mm -hmm. But Wafo Tapa does have some some super special tech where he is actually choosing to main deck Niv Mizzet, mm -hmm. and that's probably what broke game one wide open. Yeah, yeah, an uncounterable threat that immediately gains value, just overloading the the answers available to your opponent it is a great spot to be in. I'm really curious to see which control deck rises supreme. Uh, I think that things are definitely going to change once we hit the next set, once we get Hallowed Fountain, Godless Shrine, that sort of thing, Paul. But uh, for now, is it Jeskai? Is it Grixis? Is it straight blue-white? These questions are closer to being answered than ever before. Yeah, everything is currently still just up in the air. I think one of the weaknesses, I think one of the strengths of the Jeskai deck mm -hmm. is the fact that it has good answers to kind of the aggressive swarm strategies of both mono red and mono white. Def On the flip, uh, Yeah, with Defin and Clarion. On the flip side, it does struggle against a lot of kind of the can't be countered heavy hitting cards mm -hmm. that people have used to counter that, those strategies. Cards like Carnage Tyrant, cards like Banefire mm. uh, are cards that people have played to kind of beat the Jeskai decks. Meanwhile, if you play black, you have access. You have access to a very powerful hand disruption spell in Thought Erasure, which allows you to proactively remove and deal with those can't be countered threats. Yeah, and, and I agree with what you're saying with with what Jesco's weakness is. And you know, playing Esper or playing Straight Blue White opens up another raft of, uh, of weaknesses. But if you can commit heavier to White to play Settle the Wreckage, for example, a card that we've really moved away from in Standard at the moment, uh, you know, you're sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul a little bit with bolstering those strengths but I think chess guy just generally is the best setup to tussle with with a with the wide open nature of standard. Right. But as the metagame shifts mm. and people understand how to attack the Jeskai deck, that's when you might look for other color combinations like Demir or Grixis mm. to be able to attack these aggressive decks. And I think the point that we're making about the the diversity within sub archetypes can really be extended across the entire format. Yep. There's no consensus on the best guilt build of Golgari. There's no consensus on the best way to build your white aggressive decks. And we're going to see some pretty uh, some pretty fascinating development in the the coming months and weeks, especially after the all the data points we've gathered from uh, this weekend here in Atlanta. Right well, now, however, Mihara with a duress to kick things off. One thing that I'll note is that I think um, the black green deck just has an incredible sideboard plan against most decks in the field, and that's typically typically the case for various black green mid range strategies. I think game one, you're probably fine 50 50 against most of the decks in the field because you have a nice mix of removal and uh, and threats. But after sideboard, you can really just have these really heavy hitters, cards like Duress, one of the one of just the best cyborg cards ever printed. Oh, of all, uh, all the time. Right. Uh, on top of, you know, he's even got cards like Death Gore Scavenger to eat away at the graveyard. And we even saw Wild Growth Walker do mm -hmm. some work there to kind of give yourself that life buffer 
to make sure that you don't get burned out. <laughs> John Finkel testing the waters here. Sneaky, cheeky little attack with the Electromancer. But uh, Mihara is no fool, and he's going to block with his 1-3, not sneaking through that po those points of damage now. And here we are seeing the power of Goblin Electromancer. Four mana worth of spells cast off of two lands, Paul, and that is just huge. If you can chain your Charter Course into Tormentic Voice, into what have you, you're gaining a huge mana advantage, right. much more so than uh, you know a single Druid of the Cow is going to give you. Absolutely. That, that Goblin Electromancer has already generated two mana for John Finkel. And he's sculpted a much better hand as a result, although no Arc Like Phoenix is in the bin just yet. Here's a Jade Light Ranger revealing Wild Growth Walker. And we'll see what Finkel's next move is now that uh, Mihara is getting on the board with a 4 3. He's having to have a think about it. We can have a look at what's going on in his hand. Another Electromancer and a Crackling Drake. The Drake at this stage, just a 3 4. But drawing a card's nice, and, th and this is one of the key aspects of the Izzet Strike deck, something that we refer to as velocity, right? It can burn through its library pretty quick. Absolutely. With cards like Chart of Course, Discovery Dispersal, Tormenting Voice, just a lot of ways to churn through your deck. Even a radical idea. Mihara offers the trade here, the 4-3, for the 3-4. Let's see what Finkel uh, uh, thinks of it. Nope, just going to take the damage down to 16. I guess he values that, uh, that Crackling Drake a little higher. Oh, yeah. The upside for the Drake, especially over time, um, it's just he needs that kind of pressure to deal with uh, Mihara. And look look at this. Mihara going for the main phase, Vraska's Contempt. Uh, just in case, John Finkel brought in cards like Negate or Disdainful Stroke uh, to counter the Contempt. Finkel does have ac access to Counter Magic post board, but we don't see any of it in his hand right now. And Opt joins the party, and I think Finkel's going to fire it off straight away and see if he can improve the grip that he's got. Yeah, he definitely needs to find a threat here. Mm. He's not working with a whole lot. He's got an Electromancer and some lands in hand with a maximized velocity. And Mihara is able to play that value game masterfully. Here's a chart of course now for oh, Finkel. Is, is he, he going to do it again here? Go, run, run, <laughs> run the attack to draw cards? Oh, or maybe the maximized velocity to get in for three damage? <laughs> That one seems less likely. Yeah, potentially less likely here. <laughs> we are going to get in, stuck in with a Goblin Electromancer here. I think Finkel just looking to, uh, to again, burn through his library. Two cards off the top, thanks to Charter Course. And there's an Arc Light Phoenix. And an Intransibility. Okay. We wanted that was really good. and now we found them. That was quite strong. And with that Electromancer on the battlefield, John Finkel could potentially steal the Druid of the Cal if he wanted to. He might just wait until he can actually steal the J Light Ranger or potentially an even bigger threat if Mihara plays one on the following turn. So Mihara does have Wild Growth Walker and Merfolk Branch Walker in hand here. So that, that means that he's going to be able to set up a nice little Explore Engine this turn around. But Finkel, as you say, Paul, can start to uh, pick apart the creature-based strategy of the uh, of the Japanese Hall of Famer here with his uh, with his entrancing melody. His Wild Growth Walker immediately followed up by a Murfolk Branch Walker, leaving an Assassin's Trophy in hand for Mihara. Ooh, and another Wild Growth Walker. I think he might put this one in the graveyard because he doesn't have any Explorer cards in hand. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Mihara's hand, he does have a Carnage Tyrant, so he really wants to find land number six to slam that Carnage Tyrant. So Carnage Tyrant, Assassin's Trophy in hand. That 7-6 uh, could be deployed as early as next turn if the fates smile upon Mihara. Let's see what Finkel can cook up this turn, however. Yeah, I imagine Finkel is going to look to use the Entrancing Melody to deal with one of the creatures on the battlefield. It's actually kind of tricky. He could, he could go for the Wild Growth Walker, but you could also think, well, given that Mihara bin the other Wild Growth Walker that was on top of his library. You can kind of assume that Mihara un is unlikely to have another Explorer card mm -hmm. in hand. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, do you want to just take the J Light Ranger, which is currently the biggest creature on the battlefield? Three mana mind control? Right. Alternatively, you could also just steal the Branch Walker because stealing a three power creature means that you could keep the uh, right. J Light Ranger at bay as well. And right. given that it's untapped, you can actually preserve some life points. Immediately, right. Yeah, of course, it, it's going to be uh, ready to block straight away. And of course, only going to cost two mana thanks to the cost reduction of. Goblin Electromancer. We don't often see the Goblin Electromancer cost reduction being relevant more than for more than one mana often, but I mean, right. an, with an X spell? Oh. oh, yeah. Does John just have like a random explosion in his sideboard? That would be nice. <laughs> That'd yeah. be huge. Yeah. <laughs> just Bane Fire, Explosion, everything yeah. you can pull together here. And I imagine uh, there's also. So, so if he does the Entrancing Melody to steal either the Wild Growth Rocker, yeah, yeah, okay, like so it. he's going to steal the Wild Growth Rocker, he can also just go ahead and hard cast an Arc Light Phoenix this turn, too. Yep, yep. With four mana available, we can take to the skies now on the uh, on the wings of Guai here. Look at this. Well, not Guai here, sorry. He's an eagle. Fox. 
yeah. Fox the Phoenix. <laughs> now playing it defensively. So John Finkel does have a pretty good defense setup, but Mihara does have that carnage timer. Can he find land number six? to continue to put pressure on John Finkel. We've seen some explore triggers uh, find its way uh, through the deck, and now we see the uh, uh, an untapped basic get it done now. Carnage Tyrant comes down for Mihara. That's a big play here for him, and Finkel is going to be hard-pressed to find an answer to the 7-6. Fin Finkel needs a Drake. He wants a Drake. He needs to find a way to race that Carnage Tyrant. He's already down to 12 life. Another Goblin Electromancer off the top here for Finkel. Maybe the old triple block is going to have to be the solution now. See what he wants to do. His hand is not particularly well set up. Maximize velocity also in hand here for Finkel. Yeah, I mean, Finkel, I guess, just has a ragtag army of creatures here that he's going to need to use to block that Carnage Tyrant. And he probably wants to set up a block where he can still beat a singular removal spell that Mihara might have to, permanent, to, to make sure that he can deal with that Carnage Tyrant. And I'll tell you what, he's actually going to have to. Assassin's Trophy, the final card in Mihara's hand. So it's going to be a quad block at the minimum to contest that Carnage Tyrant if Mihara doesn't find... I mean, if he finds a second removal spell, it's going to be even worse. Oh, but ravenous tuba that was a big one. Well, he's really going to turn the screws on Finkel here. What can he do to get himself back into this now that the 7-6 is completely dominating the board? Now Mihara just has a good attack with all of his creatures. He's going to keep the Druid of the Cowl back to keep up that Assassin's Trophy. And John Finkel in really, really tough oh, situation mate, here. He is between a rock and a hard place here because the 7-6 the, the Trampler demands an answer. I think he's going to have to put all four of his creatures in he front of to. Carnage Tyrant because he has to kind of expect the Assassin's Trophy. Now if he does get trophied, he will still be able to deal with that Carnage Tyrant. One damage will trample over and it'll take a total of seven from the other creatures, which would put him down to four life. Oh no, no, John. No, don't do it, mate. Oh, oh no. This is going to be really, really bad. This is going to be, ladies and gentlemen, if, you, if, you, if you're with small children, please have them look <laughs> away now because there is going to be total carnage on your screen in just a few short seconds. Makahita Mahara with two mana reveals yep. and an yep. Assassin's Trophy. And John Finkel is put into the ground. He finds a basic land, but this is a ferocious three for one now. And he's taking even more damage. And so the reasoning behind why John Finkel did this, even though he, he was maybe 70% certain that Mihara might have that removal spell there is, he wants to put himself in a position to win. Mm. And if, in order for him to put himself in a position to win, he needs to make the block that kind of cleans up Mihara's board as efficiently as possible. And that includes basically doing that he, that he, doing the block that he did in that previous turn. And, you know, Mihara just happened to have it. It comes back to a principle that's really important if you want to level up your game of Magic. The further you are behind, the greater the risks that you Absolutely. have to take to get back into the game become. And conversely, Paul, the further you are ahead, the less you want to expose yourself to those risks. Unfortunately, the chips did not fall the way of John Finkel, but Makihito Mihara, the Japanese Hall of Famer, the Dragon Stormer himself, the 2006 world champion, draws ever closer, Paul, to that sixth, sixth Pro Tour top eight. That's a lot of top eights. It's a lot of top <laughs> eights, my friend. It's a lot of top eights, I will tell you that. Luckily, ladies and gentlemen, We've got more magic to show you. We're going to jump across now to one of our back tables, as the players on the front tables are, of course, have uh, they've all, all uh, wrapped it up. And we're going to move over now to Tae Jun Hao against uh, Michael Burnett here. Tae Jun Hao on 11 and 1, leading the field with his, uh, with his Bo Boros aggro deck here. Uh, uh, Michael Burnett eschewing the red splash here. Oh, no, 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 excuse me. No, both of them do have the red splash, uh, both of them playing Boros aggro. But, of course, this, again, is another list where we see a lot of internal um, uh, dissimilarity in the way that they build, a lot of internal variants. Yeah, Michael Burnett actually playing a white weenie deck with Sacred Foundry and Clifftop Retreat. However, no red cards in the main, much like the list that we've seen from Channel Fireball. Um, basically looking to play red cards out of the sideboard and just keeping his list consistent. However, uh, Tae Jin Hao does play the heroic reinforcements. But, you know, ultimately, most of the cards are very, very similar. Basically, you're trying to do the similar things. Very, very cheap curve. And uh, ultimately, however, Tajan how outclassed by the uh, the card quality of Michael Burnett. You know, he had, he had an army of hawks and uh, and falcons and all that sort of stuff. And Michael Burnett able to harness the power of the Nullish Marshal. So that is that, my friends. This round is in the books. A very uh, a cheeky peek there, um, uh, Paul, into the Boros Agro Mirror, which was the last match to finish in a round where we had Wafo Tapa and Yasuoka on the control mirror. So 
all of our established norms about competitive magic being thrown out the window, but that is that, ladies and gentlemen. As we welcome you back to the booth, Riley Knight, Paul Chown, wrapping up coverage of round number 13, drawing ever closer to the top eight. Paul, very excited to see what's coming our way in the coming rounds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we had some incredible games, especially that game one with John mm. Nickel. Just, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm sure somebody's going to run the numbers to figure out exactly what the percent chance of him actually being able to do what he did was. Mm. But, I mean, that was incredible to see. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's also nice seeing the evolution of these control decks where they're actually playing win conditions, mm. right? People are playing Crackling Drakes. People are playing Niv Visits. So games actually end within a reasonable <laughs> yeah, yeah, reasonable yeah. amount of time yeah. instead of some of the grind fest that we've seen in the past. Yeah, that's true. No, uh, you know, uh, rest in peace, uh, <laughs> Elixir of Immortality <laughs> as a one-off. Yeah, right. no, that's, that's not the world we live in right now. Right now, my friends, we are going to take a break. We'll be back live from Atlanta in a few short moments. So stick with us. We'll see you back here at Pro Tour Guilds of Ravnica after this.